Hey all and welcome to another exciting tutorial. Building a convincing night scene can sometimes be challenging because the interior of the building stands out so much more. However, with an interior kit from Roomettes, some extra woodland scenics lights, and a few 3D printed details, we'll have an amazing night scene that will fool your eyes. So let's not waste any more time and get building. This video will feature the Freight Depot building from Woodland Scenics. This kit was an absolute breeze to build, so I won't spend too much time going over the basics. There's not really much in the way of instructions, given that it's a simple structure. Excess sprue is simply cut and sanded clean. Some of the corners aren't at a perfect right angle, and we'll need a bit of sanding to get them nice and square. Just make sure you don't accidentally sand away the corners that have the brick detail on them. And don't forget to test fit often to check your progress. The Roomettes kits are a snug fit, so be sure to remove the excess flashing from the interior walls as well. To get a better view of the interior, given that we're putting all this time and effort into detailing it, I'll remove a couple of the doors. Using a tool like the Nibbling Cutter from Micromark makes this job much easier and not to mention very accurate. The only downside is that the door will be chewed up into lots of little pieces. If you wanted to add a hole for a window or a door in another wall, this would be the way to go. The edges are cleaned with a small amount of filing. Now for painting. But before we paint, as always, they get a quick wash, rinse and dry in some mildly soapy water. The primer I'm using is a red oxide. Given that the main wall colour is brick, this seemed like an obvious choice. The rest of the brick colour is added using an artist's sponge. Each colour is lightly stippled over the entire wall, with the sponge gradually building up the colour. I ended up starting with Vallejo Brown Rose, followed by Mahogany, and finally Sand Yellow. Given that I'll be applying more layers over the top, I sealed the base layer first with a misting of dull coat. Mortar lines are added with some dust pigment from the scale modeler's supply. This method is very easy to do and you have a lot of control over the final look. If at any point you're not happy, simply wash the pigment off with water. A liberal amount is applied over the entire wall until the mortar lines are filled in. Then drag your finger over the wall, gradually removing the excess from the surface of the brick, leaving behind the pigment between the bricks. You may find some gaps between the bricks aren't recessed enough. So, you may need to carve them a little deeper so that the pigment stays where you want it. Having a very slightly damp finger may help. Or if that doesn't work, a damp paper towel will get the job done. Just try to avoid pressing down on the paper towel, otherwise it will remove not only the pigment from the top of the bricks, but it will also remove it from between the bricks as well. Now we just need to remove any excess pigment from the stonework and around the windows and doors. Sealing the pigment was done with a cheap matte varnish, which as you can see helps tone down the colour. However, to further tone down the colour I also went over the walls with some Vallejo tan earth to further blend the mortar lines in with the rest of the wall. The stonework is painted in a similar fashion. A base colour of splinter camouflage was used doing my best to avoid getting any of the colour on the brickwork. The sponge technique was used with tan earth, followed up with a stone grey. The mortar lines for the stonework was done using a black wash, as opposed to the pigment method used earlier. The wash significantly darkens the colour, so be sure to keep this in mind when selecting the colours for your wall. Also, the wash softens the layer below it, so avoid brushing it around too much or you'll end up with a grey sludge instead of nice defined lines. Window detail is pre-moulded, so you'll need to paint it as best you can without accidentally painting over the bricks. Making the beams look more wooden is achieved by scribing lines along each section with a razor saw. 
The beams are painted a wood colour and the black wash is applied over the top. To further highlight the rough texture, I dry brush some deck tan over the top and it's just a very light coat. Now we can start piecing this building together. It's very straightforward. Using something like precision 123 blocks makes it much easier to get perfect right angles. These are also available from Micromark. Because I'll be making a removable roof, I cut some roof supports to match the roof pitch with 1mm styrene. These are then glued onto the roof section I cut out using 0.5mm styrene. If it doesn't sit flush, you may need to sand the tops of the walls a little so it sits flat. With the roof undercoated and painted, I add the roof truss end details. Cutting multiple pieces all the same is much easier with a tool like the Micromark Chop It. The kit comes with a tar paper roof, However, I decided to make a corrugated iron roof. For this I used the Brunel Hobbies Corrugated Iron Maker and some heavy duty barbecue foil. You really don't need a lot of foil, this roll will basically last a lifetime. The foil is smoothed using the back of my fingernail and cut to the size I want each sheet to be. Next the sheet is placed on the corrugated iron maker and the tool is used to emboss the corrugations into the foil. I flip the sheet a couple of times to ensure there is an even amount of embossing and so it doesn't curl too much. Try to avoid pressing too firmly on the first couple of passes or you'll tear a hole into the foil. Each sheet is glued with a fast setting super glue and a guideline is drawn so that each row of sheets are square. Now it's simply a matter of working along gluing each sheet down until the roof is covered, making sure to overlap each sheet so that the grooves line up. Excess sheet from the ends is removed with a sharp hobby knife. We can't leave the foil all shiny like this, so to dull it down I give it a light coat of gull grey mixed with a few drops of aluminium for a metallic colour. Of course I had to use my DIY paint shaker. For those wondering, my airbrush is an Iowata Revolution and the compressor I'm using is a Sparmax TC501 ARC. Don't forget to use a mask or work in a well ventilated area to avoid breathing in the paint fumes. The kit comes with a chimney, but I'm also adding some 3D printed air vents for a bit of extra detail. The roof still looks too new, so to add more aging, I stipple some rust spots using the sponge and Vallejo rust, focusing on the areas where the two sheets join. Further blending and softening of the rust effect is done by airbrushing the rust colour over some spots. A small mask using a piece of paper can also be used to help direct where and where not to have the paint applied. It also helps highlight some of the individual sheets. Lastly, some dark earth pigment is dusted over the entire roof, adding an aged, dusty look. That completes the exterior, and now we can focus on the interior and adding the lights. As you'll see, the Roomette's kits are very easy to build. This one comes with the room modules, a few boxes and three LEDs that plug straight into the Woodland Scenics light hub. Once the module is removed from the page, simply bend each tab as indicated. On this module I wanted the staircase to look a little bit more three-dimensional, so by photocopying the stairs and then sticking them onto a piece of foam core, I was able to get the illusion of them being 3D. Now just add glue to the tabs where indicated and fold. It's really straightforward. 
Next, add the interior detail like the staircase. A lot of the extra detail I'm adding to the interior was 3D printed on the Anycubic Photon 3D printer using their grey resin. It's simply amazing how finely detailed the prints come out. I really like the grey resin because it's less obvious if you miss a spot of paint in a corner. When gluing the rooms into the building, just be sure to avoid getting glue on the windows. I accidentally did this here, however by cutting a small access hole, it was easy enough to replace the window with a fresh piece of glazing. Then we can just glue the hatch closed when done. This large storage room sits up from the base. To ensure it sits exactly where I want it when it's glued, I first push it into position. Once happy, I add some styrene stoppers underneath. Now when I add glue, I can easily push the module down until it stops on the styrene blocks and I know it'll be in the perfect position. An extra detail that was added was a wooden dock outside the storage room door. A small template was created and pieces of strip wood were cut again using the Micromark chopper. The pieces were dyed using India ink. Now it's just a matter of carefully assembling the pieces and gluing it onto the side of the building with some tacky glue. Additional lights from Woodland Scenics was added above the two rear doors. Small holes were drilled for the wires, and you may need to create a small hatch again for the wires to poke through the roomette's kit. The light simply glues onto the wall. The rest of the interior lights are glued into their respective positions, and finally the windows that don't have a view of the interior have black paper added to obscure the view inside. With the building for the most part complete, I can start planning out the rest of the diorama. I've decided to use 6mm plywood for the base. Once the track and the building have been positioned, I trace around the edges. The wires for the LEDs need to thread down through the base, so in a spot near the middle of the building I cut a hole for the wires. The plywood is glued down to some polystyrene. This will give us some room underneath for the electronics. Once the glue is dry, the excess foam is removed. I find using the hot knife along with the sled tool from the hot wire foam factory gives me very nice clean edges that are perfectly square with the plywood. This will help later when I use the PVC foam board to finish the edges of the diorama. The LEDs will plug straight into the Woodland Scenics light hub. To make it easier to plug the power in and out, I added a convenient plug to the power supply. This is why I like working with foam. It's so easy to cut and shape exactly as you need. The hot wire tools make light work of cutting the foam. I make sure to create enough room for the light hub as well as the wires from the LED. The track gets trimmed roughly to size and glued down with standard wood glue. Once it's firmly fixed in position, the excess track is cut away with the Dremel from the edges. For a bit of interest, I'm going to add a dirt road crossing. These Woodland Scenics grade crossings are really designed for Code 83 track, so to make them work with Code 70 track, I had to sand down the underside to get it sitting just below the tops of the rails. It can then be glued down with either plastic cement or some super glue. Before applying Sculptor Mold, I mask the track. I'm actually using a product that's called Sculptor Modeling Mix from Officeworks in Australia. However, it's basically the same stuff as Sculptor Mold. It's mixed to a thick consistency and then simply applied anywhere you need to build up the scenery. If you're applying it over a wood or another plaster surface, just remember to pre-wet the area first so it adheres to the surface. I move and manipulate it with my hands until I get the look I'm after. 
As it begins to set, I continue smoothing it out, paying particular attention to the roads and getting them nice and smooth. Once dry, a base layer of brown paint is applied. You may need to water it down as the plaster sucks up the moisture quite fast. It doesn't have to be perfect, just a rough coat will be fine. The dirt texture I use to cover the surface is a mixture of roughly one part dried dirt from the garden mixed with one part beige tile grout. The grout lightens the dirt colour, giving it a much more realistic look and for the road I add more grout to further lighten the colour. I start by spraying the hilly areas first with my glue mixture. One part Mod Podge mat, three parts water and a drop of dish soap. This helps the coarse dirt texture stick to the hills rather than slide off and roll down to the bottom. Next the fine texture layer is applied over the top covering the entire area. And lastly the road and any areas where vehicles will travel are covered with the lighter grout texture. This is all fixed down with a misting of isopropyl alcohol which helps the glue soak into the dirt texture. And then a misting of the glue mixture I mentioned earlier. Any unwanted spots of plaster can be removed with a stiff brush and some water. And now we just leave it to dry. If you find there are still areas of white plaster showing, they can be covered with a little bit of watered down brown paint. I tend to like the light grey ballast most, and Matt's ballast from Australian Modeler looks quite good. It's pretty straightforward to apply, doing my best to remove excess ballast from the tops of the tyres and vacuuming away any unwanted ballast. It too is fixed down by first spraying isopropyl alcohol, and then using a syringe, the glue is applied along the length of the track. If the glue dries and leaves behind a white area like this, you can fix it by gently wiping it with a little more alcohol. Even misting the alcohol over it again will fix the problem. Now for my favourite part, adding the static grass. I'm using the Woodland Scenic Static King along with some of their 2, 4 and 7mm grasses and some of the Knock Wild Grass as well. I mix different colours together depending on the look I'm after. To glue the grass down I'm using Woodland Scenic's Static Tack. It's applied over the base in the desired areas and spread out with a brush. The magic happens when we turn on the static grass applicator, press the grounding wire close to the area and start shaking the applicator over the glue. Keep moving along until the area is covered. To remove excess grass you can either use a vacuum cleaner with a stocking over the end to collect loose grass fibres and then use them again in another area or if the diorama is small enough you can flip it over and tap the base shaking away the excess grass. Either way works well. To give the grass a more rough unkept appearance I also press areas down with a skewer or my finger depending on how rough I want the area to look. Then just keep working away in small sections until the area is finished. To help blend the longer grass fibres into the dirt, especially near the edges of the road, I add random areas of smaller 2 and 4mm grass fibres. One of my favourite ground textures to use is actually dried up leaves from the backyard. They get blended into a fine grade and then sifted. I'm left with some very nice fine leaf textures and larger bits of bark and leaves for the more coarse texture. I use that along with a range of Woodland Scenics ground foams to build up texture and colour over the ground. It all gets applied randomly over the diorama, trying to get a natural look. Any leaves or foam that end up in undesired locations, like along the track or the road are brushed away, and then one last time it's all fixed down with alcohol and glue.
and we're getting close to finishing. The building can now be glued down. I use Helmar SuperTac glue for this. And before it's completely dry, it's a good idea to quickly check the clearance between the building and the track. The edges of the building are blended with dirt texture, using a brush to help push the dirt up against the building, and it's glued down. To help prevent getting a glue line in the dirt, I missed more alcohol over the area, using some paper as a mask for the building. Even more lighting is added with these Woodland Phoenix street lights. They are really easy to use. Just figure out where you want them, drill the hole, thread the wires through, and they plug straight into the light hub. Another reason I really like working with foam, it's so easy to neatly run the wires under the model. Then just glue the light into position. The wires are quite long, so you can trim them back to the required length. However, I generally prefer to bundle the excess wire, just in case I make changes and need the extra length later down the road. Trees and bushes are added using fine leaf foliage, briar patch, and some of the Woodland Scenics tree armatures, and a couple of the Backman Scenescapes oak trees I used in Realistic Scenery Volume 16. Once you decide on where to place the trees, I drill the hole and glue them in with SuperTac glue. The bushes have some SuperTac glue applied and are just pressed down into the desired location. The roads are detailed with yellow ochre pastel to highlight the wheel tracks and areas of high traffic like outside the front office door. A large soft brush works well for this. I keep brushing to blend the lighter areas in with the darker spots on the road. The same approach is taken with the track as well, although I use a dark earth colour. Some extra 3D printed details were added around the place to give some life. All the 3D printed items will be available to download by visiting the free download section at bouldercreekrailroad.com. And finally, the edges are tidied up by adding a strip of 3mm PVC foam board that is glued and then painted black to help frame the scene. And we're finished. Adding lights to a scene can dramatically help improve the realistic look of a model in low light, and it really highlights all the effort we went into detailing the interior with the Roomettes kit and the 3D printed details. If you're enjoying the videos and would like to help support the channel, please consider joining me on Patreon. Sharing and subscribing to the channel also helps a lot. Cheers and thanks for watching.